So welcome everybody to this uh, introductory session on understanding and working with the bowel nosodes. I, I think this is a really exciting topic and I'm, I'm very excited to be teaching it. And as always, um, I really appreciate your presence and participation in these. I, I find that when I have the opportunity to teach something, it's an opportunity to look at the holes in my understanding and and uh, misconceptions I might have and to further research those and, and to kind of get it together. Because if I'm going to pass something along to you guys, I uh, maybe it should be a little more intact than, than the threads and pieces I have in my head. So this is a really great opportunity um, for me to, to help put these things together. Um, I, I really enjoy doing it. So once again, thanks everybody. So I want to start out with a case to lead us in. Okay. And um, this is a 24-year-old woman who presents acutely in the midst of hay fever season for her. So it's mid-June. Um, her season is late May through the 4th of July annually that she has hay fever. The rest of the year, she's essentially allergy-free, or entirely, actually. Uh, she takes antihistamines as needed, and they help a little, but she doesn't tolerate the grogginess. And she has work, and she has a kid, and, you know, it's just too much to, to negotiate around that. She's tried a neti pot. Um, she's tried supplementing with quercetin, nettles, red clover, local honey. None of it seems to be helping much. She said an eyebright tincture seems to help briefly, but she goes through an awful lot of it. Um, symptoms are runny nose, sneezing, itchy eyes, and asthma. And she feels sick all over. It's a hard to describe feeling of just kind of just a general malaise, sickness, weakness, uh, especially after sneezing. Her eyes and her nose are the worst part of the whole thing for her. Uh, sneezing, she says, it feels like my nose is swollen inside. It feels dry inside, but running. Um, I'll go through six, seven handkerchiefs a day and soak them through entirely. Uh, discharge is thin, clear, watery. Nose itches inside. And objectively, there, there's no irritation of the nares or philtrum. So, um, Someone, <laughs> thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, someone asked, "What is a neti pot?" A neti pot is a small, um, uh, usually ceramic pot um, with a little spout on it that you put up into one nostril, and you pour a, a saline solution. Sometimes people put herbs in, into it as well, and it flushes the nose and sinuses out, uh, rinses them, and so it'd be used here to get rid of the catarrh, and and and. Ir irrigated in a soothing solution and hopefully to, to irrigate the pollen off of the nasal mucosa. Um, her chest gets tight particularly uh, when, we, and when it's particularly bad and, and she has some wheezing but this, this is kind of at the, at the worst parts of this. There's not much coughing and she isn't bringing anything up with a cough. And listening to her, and right now she's not feeling that, but listening to her, there is a mild and, ex and expiratory wheeze I can hear with a stethoscope and some prolongation of the expiratory phase, which is indicative of asthma. The peak flow, using a little uh, instrument in the office, the handheld unit, her peak flow is 340, and that's about 80% of the predicted maximum for a woman of her age and, and height, which is how we norm that data. Um, so at 80%, usually a person doesn't feel symptomatic, but the red on the edge and any little thing will tip them over into feeling symptomatic. Usually about 70% of your maximal peak flow is when you feel asthmatic. It varies, but um, she says, I get tickling and itching in my voice box and gestures to her larynx, and her voice can get hoarse. And generally, everything is worse with bright sunlight. Her eyes, she doesn't tolerate the sun. The sneezing is much worse in sunlight. And in general, she feels worse overall in sunlight, uh, much so. Uh, everything is much better when washing the face. Her eyes, her nose, and, and in general are, are better when she rinses her face. And she prefers cool water to rinse with. And she's better sitting uh, and, and qu keeping quiet and calm and, and unstimulated. And, and that's everything is, is better that way. Okay. The sick feeling, um, I asked you to elaborate on, and it, it's hard for her to describe, uh, but it's an empty feeling. She indicates her abdomen, um, but didn't seem too pleased with that as the explanation. It's a washed out feeling. She needs to sit down. Um, it's a general malaise. Now, y you guys feel free to take this case um, to your repertories and analyze it. Um, organize it the 
Betting House and X diagram would be a great way to organize this case. Pick out four to six um, uh, representative uh, rubrics, uh, you know, representing evenly the, the chief complaint, the modalities, the concomitants, the sensations, and descriptors. And I think it'll be pretty easy to come up with the remedy that she needs for this case, which is not a bowel no sod, but we'll get to that, okay? Um, it's a pretty clear euphrasia case, okay? Euphrasia, euphrasia officinaris, or, um, uh, you know, the, botanically it's gone through some name changes, but pretty familiar remedy for us, okay? And, of course, she was using this in crude form, in tincture form, and deriving some homo... homo <clears throat> excuse me. Deriving some, I would suggest, homeopathic benefit from it in that crude dose. Um, so I, I decided to give it to her in potency. So I put 12C in water. Uh, many ways we could have effectively dosed this case. But I put 12C in water, uh, one pellet in an ounce in a dropper bottle, uh, 30 cc's of water, um, and told her to take two to four drops as needed up to four times a day after four succussions and kind of set her free to titrate that to her need. But the case isn't over at all, by any means here. You know, Kent tells us in his lecture on Allium Sipa, and you know, I, I get upset with Kent sometimes and sometimes praise him. He was very, I, th I think Kent ran very hot and cold on what he contributed to our profession. And this is a place where he was rocking, okay? Where he really comes through first. He says, you know, the nature of hay fever is not generally understood. It's really only an explosion of chronic disease. That is, a, a, it's a manifestation of Sora, and it can be eradicated only by antisoric treatment. I think I might expand that and say that we see cases of hay fever that are soric and cases that are tubercular principally. Many a time I've seen hay fever wiped out in one season by a short-acting remedy, um, only to return just the same, uh, in the next season just the same, and perhaps a different remedy will be required. As soon as the hay fever is stopped, you must begin with treatment of the chronic disease. Okay. There'll be symptoms, if you know how to hunt for them, that differ altogether from the acute attack. Uh, when the hay fever is on, these don't appear. It's a difficult matter to find a, a, a remedy for the chronic disease. Okay, I'm reframing his language a little bit here. You keep it clear. When the hay fever is at its height, for it resembles an acute disease at that point. But it's a manifestation of Sora, like any other manifestation of Sora, as eruptions, cough, etc. could be. The nose may manifest only a certain phase of the chronic disease in any one season, which may, for instance, be suited, you know, this year to Allium Sipa, in our case this year to Euphrasia. Next year, not even guaranteed that Euphrasia is going to work for her. The best time to treat hay fever is after the acute attack subsides and until it begins the next season. So, you, you know, in order to address this chronic disease and to cure her so it doesn't happen, the best time is after it subsides, okay, before it begins again the next season. And I think most often after an acute exacerbation of, an, uh, of a chronic settles down, it's kind of like the whale splashing around at the surface. All you see is spray for a while. After the splashing stops and the whale starts to dive, it's probably the best time to take the case. So soon after the resolution of the acute flare of the chronic disease is usually our best opportunity to see the chronic disease at its clearest. If we wait too long, and we wait until, you know, November or something, you know, very far from her acute attack, um, the whale may be just too far under the surface. The chronic disease may be too latent at that phase for us to really see. We want to see the the chronic disease when it's not flaring acutely, okay, in, in, in one way or another, but when it's it's starting to, to return to its latent state, probably the best opportunity for us to see the chronic state. So Hahnemann tells us, and you know, he gets around to this in the section of the organon when he talks about mental emotional disease, so he talks about it in that context, but I don't think there's anything that applies to mental emotional disease uniquely that doesn't apply to disease as a whole, okay? So, you know, at one point in the organ on Hahnemann stops using the word mental emotional disease and uses so-called mental emotional disease and so-called somatic disease. So I'd like to follow that lead and not respecting any imaginal mind-body barrier, okay? 
So here in the context of, of um, mental emotional disease, but applying to all disease really, he says an insanity or frenzy that breaks out as an acute disease from the patient's usually quiet state may be occasioned by this or that, etc. And I'm, I'm going to throw pollen in there, okay? But it almost without exception springs from internal sora. We can generalize it, internal chronic disease that, as it were, flares up like a flame. Such a case cannot be treated straight away in its acute onset with antisoric medicines. Now that's a really profound sentence here. Such a case cannot be treated straight away in its acute outset, onset with antisoric remedies for two reasons, really. One is because if that's where you're seeing the case, you will not be able to recognize the chronic state from just this this hydra head. Okay, you'll you'll get some ideas, some glimpses, some possibilities. But um, you won't really be able to clearly see the chronic case, and finding the chronic remedy needed at that point is likely not possible. The second is, let's say we knew it. Let's say we'd taken the case a month ago, and now she comes in acutely with her hay fever. That chronic remedy is not what the body needs right now. Okay, It's in an acute flare. That needs to be settled down before that chronic remedy gets a chance to act. So Hahnemann says, rather, it must first be treated with medicines, and he gives some examples, just randomly, really, selected from the other class of proven remedies, from antisoric remedies, from remedies that are going to address this acute flare quite specifically. These should be given, as we do, in highly potentized, subtle homeopathic doses. Now, highly potentized for Hahnemann was a 30C, okay? Um, as you recall from the uh, dose and potency class, if you were there with me. okay. Un until the sore returns for the present to its previous almost latent state. You see, that's what we want. This is almost latent state, whereupon the patient appears to recover. okay. But we're not done. The patient who recovers from an acute disease by means of, of these asoric medicines, these medicines acting acutely should never be regarded as cured. On the contrary, once that acute outbreak is passed, the patient should be given as soon as possible. So we want to catch it in that almost latent phase. Don't want to wait till November here. A continued antisoric, or if it's a syphilitic case or whatever, okay, in order to entirely free from that chronic disease, from the sore, which is now latent again, but which is very liable to re-erupt in the form of attacks of the previous disease, or perhaps in other forms. If such a treatment is given, there'll be no need to fear any similar future attack as long as the patient faithfully adheres to the dietary regimen, etc., prescribed for him. So let me let me uh, jump over to questions here tonight. Um, Oh, someone asked, why, why would I not suspect that her symptom picture was somewhat a result of the large amounts of eyebright that she reports taking, similar to a cannabis indicus picture emerging when taking the case of a person who smokes pot? Well, you see, the reason a person who smokes pot on a daily basis, okay, regular users, the reason it's very hard to take their case, and you'll, and if you do, you'll usually find them in a cannabis indica picture. They don't need that as a remedy is because the substance is fat soluble and they have a continual release okay, of, of that substance into their system. Um, and they probably have to be off for months, four to six months before you could take a clean case on them. Eyebright lasts a very short period of time in the body. And um, I think if we found that her allergy symptoms were tremendously modified in the course of using the eyebright, we might think that we might be seeing proving symptoms of eyebright. But what we see is that she has a little bit of relief and it doesn't really change the picture of the story here. Okay, I think you'd have to take a lot of eyebright to uh, put yourself into a chronic euphrasia state. Okay. So she comes back in late July. So the hay fever season's over. And she says, the remedy helped more than anything else I tried. I, I took it three, four times a day um, and had 70 to 80% um, relief. And um, so I'm, I'm wanting to take her chronic case. And she says, well, I'm generally well. I, I don't really have any complaints outside of hay fever season. Um, and and the, the portion of the interview that I always emphasize, which is the listening, is a basically over at this point, okay? So I went into a review of systems. And what I find is that her menses are 
somewhat on the heavy side, not not hugely. She uses four pads a day and occasionally needs to double up pads. So it's not a lot to, um, it's, it's more than average, but it, it's not a lot. Minor cramping, two on a scale of 10, not every month. Uh, more anxious than usual when she has her PMS. She says it's general worries about everything, but I'm better when I'm around people. And, and then explains I'm an anxious person normally. It's just that it's worse before my period. Um, I work things up when I'm on my own. I need to be around people. So um, when she's around people, it makes a huge difference here for her. Um, she had said I get cracks in the corners of my nose and the corners of my mouth and they sting and I use Vaseline on them. They come and go. And my nose often feels dry inside and I use Vaseline during the winter months for my nose. Her stools are soft and I asked her, I'll show you the Bristol stool chart in a moment. I asked her to match the chart and she says Bristol types uh, four to five. We'll take a look at that in a moment. But even, um, but even when they're intact, they're skinny okay and and kind of slippery and not very well formed and they're very foul i need to open the window or turn the fan on in the bathroom okay and and this is not a, a prissy fastidious kind of individual okay so it's not that she's responding to average fecal odor so i get a rare constipation i'm a brist uh, on the bristol type one or two again she's pointing to the card for me maybe once a month or less and frequent flatulence uh, with a foul odor that can be embarrassing in public. So here, here's a, a Bristol stool chart and uh, Bristol, England is famous for this. Um, I, I think it's their major claim to fame. I, I understand. <laughs> if anyone out there is from Bristol, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive here. <laughs> but it's a major contribution to medical science actually. So her stools are like this. Okay, type four to five. Uh, like a sausage or snake, smooth and soft, but on the thin and soft end of this, okay, and kind of slimy. And type 5, soft blobs with clear-cut edges, okay. And occasionally she um, she goes type 1 or 2, less than once a month, um, between separate hard lumps like uh, sheep dung, you know, that are hard to pass, and sausage-shaped but lumpy, um, uh, kind of stuck together and hard, Okay. Uh, now, here's an interesting piece just to throw in. Aphorism 95, um, Hahnemann mentions, you know, chronically ill patients often become so accompanied to their long sufferings that they pay little or no attention to the smaller, often very characteristic accompanying befallments, which are so decisive in singling out the remedy. They, they view them as almost a part of their natural state, nearly mistaking them for health, whose true feeling they've fairly well forgotten during the course of their 15 to 20 year long suffering. And it hardly occurs to them to believe that these accompanying symptoms, these remaining smaller or greater deviations from the healthy state, could have a connection with their main malady. Here's a person who, you know, for two months a year is in misery with their hay fever. It doesn't occur to her that her slightly heavy periods, okay, the cracks on the corners of her lips, um, the, um, the, the somewhat irregular stools are anything to be concerned about. And, and so they didn't come up spontaneously in, in, in the interview. And they only came up when I started asking her more specifically um, about these kinds of concerns, you know, were these present for her. Okay. Uh, Hahnemann talks about this in, in somewhat other words in the, in the chronic diseases where he describes latent SORA, okay, or latent chronic disease. Um, where you know, he says that basically the individual gets along and doesn't recognize these, and, and the people they live with don't recognize these as being concerns or minor complaints, and um, uh, they don't think of them as out of the ordinary until something comes along that stimulates and, and perturbs that chronic disease state and pushes them either into a more fully developed chronic disease picture or into an acute exacerbation, as we're seeing here. So um, l let me just address a couple of questions before I move on. Um, um, would I say this approach makes sense with repeated herpes outbreaks, waiting until the flare-up has gone down, and then, yeah, and then taking the case and finding the remedy? Yes, very, very much so. You may find a remedy that affects that chronic herpetic state and, and, and shortens that outbreak considerably, okay? But um, eventually, I think you need to take the case to address the recurrence of that, okay? Okay. 
Yeah. Mark, Mark mentions the edible Bristol schools, stool scale. And I did not include that, Mark, in my presentation tonight because I was afraid it would offend a few people. But, um, but you gave the reference to it. And um, if uh, I'm not sure that's visible to all. If not, I'll post it at the end of the, the presentation today. <laughs> it was rather hilarious. So she tells me she also had a childhood history of eczema. Uh, she said it was pretty bad, but I grew out of it around the age of four or five, which is around when the hay fever started. And she's not able to describe the historical eczema. She, she was too young, and she doesn't remember much about it, you know. Um, she said, I still get a little, though, and she shows me. Um, she said, I get some cracked skin between my fingers and those web spaces there and, and the bases of the fingers a little bit on my knuckles, on the tops of the knuckles and on the backs of my hands. I need to use hand lotion especially in the winter when it's drier. It doesn't really bother her that much. So collecting these things together, I, I put together this analysis. Um, I, You know, the, the rubric for cracks in the corners of the nose is just too tiny to rely on, so I combined it with nose cracks, okay, to, which is still a little dicey, but I'm being pretty assiduous in combining these, okay? It's an unusual place for cracks. We don't expect a lot of remedies in here. Cracks in the corners of the mouth, Anxiety when alone, okay? It's ameliorated in company when she's around people. Pretty pretty strongly stated. These rubrics are too big to include, but I threw them in just for fun and weighted them zero so they don't really affect the analysis, okay? The dryness inside the nose, the copious menses, which I'm not going to write home about because they weren't all that copious, really. Trending that direction. Thin stool, offensive odor to the stool. And then finally, I combined the eczema symptoms, the, the, the cracks, cracks of the fingers, between the fingers, of the knuckles, back of the hands, because these are all very small. And to be safe, I thought it would best to combine those of similar meaning. And the remedies that run through are, are nitric acid, which was occurring to me. This was the remedy that was um, coming out of my personal heuristics, listening to the case, okay? You know, um, I... I think what we sometimes say intuition, but I think is the, our personal heuristics, those things we know and that are kind of coming out of the backs of our brain. Um, causticum. And lo and behold, Morgan Pure. Um, now, these three remedies are coming up here all in four rubrics. What's the difference in, in how the analysis is handling these? Why is nitric acid coming up first and Morgan Pure third and causticum second? What, what's differentiating their presence? In, in this analysis here. Grading, only the grading, okay? And remember, I, I've emphasized so often when working with the contemporary repertories or any repertory derivative of Kent's, we have to be very, very cautious of grading, especially when it comes to smaller, lesser known remedies. They're, they're ignored, they're not treated as well. If working with the Bettinghouse and Therapeutic Pocketbook, grading, might elevate itself to a little bit greater importance. Um, I think cards are out on that in, in, in my understanding of things. But yeah, so I think these three remedies all have to be considered very much with the same weight. But here this tiny remedy is not only coming through tied with these other two huge, well-known remedies, but we see it in cracks in the corners of the nose specifically. We see it in the cracks specifically between the fingers of the knuckles and backs of the hands. So this little tiny remedy, as audaciously showing up here in the analysis as it is, even the remedies that follow in only three of the active rubrics in this case um, are big remedies, okay? So if we were to do a, uh, an electronic small remedies waiting in this case, uh, Morgan Pure just shoots way, way up to the top as our um, uh, ability to do this just by, by eyeballing these remedies and saying any other small remedies to consider here. Okay, Morgan Pierre is just beating us out. And of course, it's showing up with these cracking remedies like graphitis and petroleum, okay, sulfur, okay, big, big eczemous cracking remedies. I ended up giving her Morgan Pure, uh, uh, Patterson. Um, and I, I, these are available, you know, it's interesting in the, the potencies available on these. We can find them in some of the standard potencies, but 18C is a very common potency to obtain today. Um, historically, um, Batch and the Patersons appeared to work mostly with 12C, 30C, occasionally with higher potencies, as up to 1M on some occasions, um, and, and perhaps even beyond. 
Um, but the 18Cs are readily available, and, and that's what I had in my kit. So I gave Morgan Pure Paterson 18C one pellet once, and we'll talk a little bit about this remedy. Um, this is a remedy prepared from uh, 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 stool bacterium, okay? Um, and uh, it's a bit unclear. We're going to talk about the sources of these in the class and trying to trace them down. And you're going to find individuals in, in various um, publications today suggesting clearly what these are. I think we can't state with certainty what this bacterium is, but it appears to be Morganella morganii, most likely, okay, with some other possibilities, and may well actually represent a bit of a mixed culture of several bacteria that would show up um, uh, with the same results on the bacteriologic testing that was available to Batch and to the Petersons. So follow up at four weeks. Um, she comes in, she's very excited. She says, I've got normal poops three days after the remedy. And this is very often what I'll see with these remedies it is we'll see the, the bacterial, the, the bowel dysbiosis correcting very, very quickly. Okay. Um, so she says, I got normal poops three days after the remedy. Less gas, less smelly. Um, Bristol type three to four. Um, so this would be between that smooth snake and the slightly lumpy snake, okay? Consistently for the past three weeks, more consistently formed, less odor, a big change. And she's really happy about this. Um, nose and the lips cracks, we don't know because these come and go and four weeks, it's, we don't know yet if they're gone, okay? And she might have gone this long without them. No cracking of the fingers, same story. Although maybe a little less likely to go four weeks without any evidence of that. Um, she's had one period since the last visit. It ended last week. It was maybe a little lighter. She's not really sure. She'd like to be better. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to know. I'm not noticing as much anxiety, but I have been busier than usual, usual so that could be why. You know, when she's occupied, when she's around people especially, it's not as much. So, you know, sometimes we write too much into these follow-ups, um, sometimes because people want to get better. And we have to be very careful uh, with in over-interpreting some of these things. Uh, follow-up again at 12 weeks. She missed her eight-week follow-up. She's doing pretty well, not too motivated to have to come in, you know. So now it's mid-October. And she comes in, she said, my stools are still consistently Bristol 3 to 4 type, that smooth snake to slightly lumpy much less flatulence. I realize now my belly was always a little uncomfortable. It feels so good now. And you know, we'll get responses like this from patients who don't realize that their belly was uncomfortable. They would never have told you that because, well, that's how bellies feel. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? It's just now she can retrospectively say, goodness, it's better. No nose or lip cracks, no cracking of the hands or fingers, and it would be unusual to go this long without this, okay? especially now that the weather's getting colder okay, for her. This is, this is back northeast U.S. Periods are definitely lighter, two to three pads a day, not soaking through, um, and definitely less anxiety. That, that's really clearly the case for her. Uh, Follow-up in early January. It's been about 15 weeks now since the remedy. Um, stools are a little irregular again. Um, they're still mostly Bristol 3 to 4, but they're occasionally that type four, but now that, but like they used to be skinny and soft with flatulence and a heavy feeling in her lower abdomen. Um, but that's coming and going. It's not consistent at this point. She had one nose crack last week. She said, I ate a lot of sugar over the holidays. I'm back to a normal diet now. So I suggested that we wait a little bit and, and have a return in four weeks or earlier if needed. We know that the, the ball floor is responsive to diet and perhaps you know, um, if things were urgent, maybe we'd be pressed to action right now. But I think we can afford to wait and see if she normalizes on her own or if she needs another intervention. You know, James Taylor Kent, again, in one of his pearlish moments, told us we've often acted too soon and seldom waited too long. So I think to wait eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks is, is overdoing it. But to give her four weeks to see if she recovers from her dietary indiscretions of the holidays, I think is very reasonable. So two weeks later, um, she comes in and she says, in, you know, earlier than designated, and says, definitely move in the wrong direction. Mouth and nose cracks have been troublesome. Stools are now more consistently that Bristol 4 to 5, now skinny, soft, 
some of the separate chunks, um, soft chunks with abdominal discomfort and flatulence, occasionally gassy urging and waking in the morning. Cracks over my knuckles when I'm washing the dishes. And I think I'm starting to feel more anxious again, just in the morning on waking. Okay. So, you know, at, at this point, we might re-examine the case. We don't necessarily automatically repeat the remedy. We want to see if there's something that's indicating something in another direction. And what I'm seeing here is, um, interestingly, the gassy urging on waking in the morning and the anxiety on waking in the morning. And that makes me think of what remedy that's closely related to this case. Especially if she were waking up with a strong urge to stool and had to run to the toilet when she woke up. And the anxiety and waking in the morning. Yes, sulfur. Um, and, and so, you know, I want to look at this carefully. So I just did a quick look at, at symptoms of, the, uh, of Morgan Pure related to morning. And I see that uh, we see morning as a general aggravation for this remedy. Head pain in the morning, stiffness of the lips in the morning, of the tongue in the morning, diarrhea in the morning, stool thin in the morning, urging in the morning, very similar to sulfurs, cough in the morning, um, cough loose in the morning, uh, stiffness of the fingers in the morning. Okay, here, here, this is uh, the symptoms included in the full repertory, but not in the millennium view that I'm looking in right now. That's why it shows up like this. So I think we can see this aggravation on, in the morning doesn't steer me away from the already effective remedy in the case. Okay, if this were in contradiction to the remedy given, um, that would indicate that I maybe need to look further. But I think I feel pretty confident here in repeating the remedy given. So I repeated Morgan Pure. 18C, one pellet once, uh, once again at this point. And, you know, I could kick myself for not giving it two weeks earlier, but I, I think that waiting was a reasonable thing to do um, uh, to watch what happens here. Okay. And people have asked about other interventions. People have asked, what about giving her probiotics at that point or whatever? And we're going to go into that in so much depth in the, in the course it, itself because this is also linked to that, okay? So anyway, give her that repeat the remedy. Phone follow-up a week after the repeat dose. All complaints are much better. The cracks are healed. The stools were normal on the second day after the dose. She's very happy. And the next I saw her was in late June. Now about one year following that first acute visit. And she comes into the office. She says, I thought I'd drop in to show you my nose. And she proudly displays this normal, non-drippy, non-sneezing nose and, and a dry handkerchief. And says, I've had no signs of allergy this year. Uh, stools remain Bristol type 3 to 4 consistently. I've had rare minor flatus. Uh, my abdomen feels relaxed and light. She is really thrilled with how her belly, she didn't realize her belly felt bad before. Okay, My menses are normal. I have no nose or mouth cracks, no cracking in my fingers and hands. And the anxiety feels really quite entirely resolved. So this brings us to the topic of the course, um, working with bowel nosodes. And I want to mention first, this this was one of the early cases in which I actually employed a bowel nosode. And um, I chose this tonight because it's an, an exceedingly unusual case. And that's that a bowel nosode actually shows up in a careful classical analysis of the case. It actually comes up like a regular remedy does. And this is exceedingly unusual. Okay. When it does, you really need to pay attention to it. Um, more often, we're going to find this as the needed remedy in another way. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight and in depth in the upcoming class. So, you know, the bowel nosodes are remedies prepared from this stuff. And um, I, I would, uh, yeah, and it, it's a lot easier when I see my audience in front of me. Um, uh, knowing who's laughing and who feels offended. But I used to poo-poo the whole notion of bowel nosodes, you know, and we could get into a lot of puns about this. You know, I thought it was a bit of, you know, piece of crap. And uh, <laughs> um, just another opportunity to uh, to uh, promote Farouk as a, as a teacher. Um, I'm remembering many, many years ago, uh, shortly after I first uh, developed an acquaintance with Farouk, uh, asking him, uh, mentioning once in, in passing that, the, the topic of bowel nosodes came up, and and I, I, as I recall the conversation, it went something like my saying, I, I really didn't use them in my practice. And he looked at me astonished and looked at me and said, Will, 
I thought you were, I took you for an intelligent man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, you know, it was one of those times where it was delivered so, um, so forthrightly and, 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 and at the same time so gently and, 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 um, and, and compassionately as, as, as Frioke has the ability to do. But it was one of those times of, I thought you were an intelligent man, <laughs> realizing that there was something that I was missing and, and perhaps ought to pay attention to this aspect of practice that, um, that I'd paid so little attention to. Now I want to go back just a little bit, and we're going to do more of this in the class itself, but I want to talk about the environment in which this whole therapeutic method developed. Um, we can go back. Ideas on auto-intoxication predate this fellow by thousands of years, but, but Charles Bouchard, 1866, was one of the folks in this era, I think, who, who um, was the voice of, uh, of some beliefs and understandings that um, uh, were much broader than a single individual, but he brought them together and, and uh, in, in a lecture on auto-intoxication and disease, kind of brought together a lot of ideas and and, and crystallized them into the medical community of the day and described the colon as a receptacle of la and laboratory of poisons. This is shortly after the, um, uh, the, the advent of germ theory, the recognition of bacteria, um, their role in fermentation, uh, their role in, um, uh, in, in, to some part in disease. Okay, and I think people were trying to figure out what to do with them. They figured there were bacteria in the stool, in the colon, and uh, the colon was seen largely in this day as a, as a receptacle of, of fermentation and putrefaction. Okay, where the chemical breakdown of products of bacterial action on the food um, or putrefaction could be absorbed systemically. Okay, and these these toxins, and there were a few quote toxins named, but mostly these toxins were. Uh, were, were um, hypothetical in, in, in sort. And the idea is if those toxins weren't handled properly, the end result could manifest in, in disease over time. And, and we, um, we say that disease being called um, uh, auto-intoxication, um, uh, toxemia of the bowel, et cetera, et cetera. And, and through this period, through the you know, uh, mid-1800s up through the 1900s, we see a lot of discussion of this role of auto-intoxication or intestinal putrefaction in a lot of disease, um, uh, in aging, we see it attribu um, aging attributed to it, to a lot of chronic disease, to neurasthenia, um, the, those diseases that would collectively today be, be uh, described as um, depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, etc., all described as this auto-intoxication process. Now today, we have a very different perspective on these bowel bugs. You know, in, in a review article written um, in 2012 here, um, the author's writing, most gut microbes are either harmless or of benefit to the host. Okay, The gut microbiota uh, uh, protects against enteropathogens, you know, bugs from the outside world, extracts nutrients and energy from our diets and contributes to normal immune function. And we're going to go into this in depth in the upcoming course as well. Um, but kind of a summary of what the gut bugs are doing in humans today is, wow, <laughs> okay, I mean, it's enormous. And we could get lost in the details of specific physiologic interactions uh, between the gut microbe, uh, microbial community and, and the human host. Um, but although uh, the microbial community might see that relationship as the other way around you know they they, they might be the, might be like the the mice running the universe in uh, in in uh, in uh, the hitchhiker's guide they they may see their role as more important than us we, we may just be a substrate to them okay but the bottom line is that there's there's a lot of stuff going on that we are beginning to understand and uh, and, and it's it, there's a richness and diversity in these in these interactions that's really interesting that's much much more profound than a simple matter of toxicity or putrefaction from these bugs in our guts. But the perspective that um, was that was evolving in the medical community of the day, of the time of the development of these bowel nosodes, was this. Um, this is from Christian Herter, um, Common Bacterial Infections of the Digestive Tract. 
who says it's impossible to avoid the entrance of bacteria into the digestive tract. I believe the chief significance of the obligate intestinal bacteria, you know, those that are living there, lies in their potential capacity for thus checking the development of other types of organisms capable of doing injury. So rather than looking at, you know, this richness that we see today of the essential nature of these uh, coexisting organisms with our being, the perspective of the day was that there were two types of bugs, those that took up space and those that could do us harm. Okay, And those living in the gut were taking up the space and preventing those from doing us harm. Okay, And very early on, there fell a differentiation between two groups of bugs. Okay, Between those um, bacilli, those um, uh, um, entero, um, entero, uh, uh, enteric bacteria, the, the bacilli that could ferment lactose and those couldn't. And um, er early on we developed the devel ability to differentiate between these in culture. Uh, McConkie was a bacteriologist for the uh, uh, Liverpool sewage system and he developed a, 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 a medium uh, which was put up in agar that had in nutrients and, and uh, pH indicators in it, such that if you grew bacteria that could uh, ferment lactose, they would turn red, the colonies would turn red, and bacteria that could not ferment lactose remained clear or white on here. So um, it became possible to differentiate between these two large classes of bacteria, those that could ferment lactose, those that couldn't. And in a kind of, what I would suggest is kind of a simplistic view of the day, there was a large distinction drawn between these two groups of bacteria. Now understanding that the bacteria today we understand that come out in the feces represent a very small proportion of the diversity of species living in the gut. Okay, And those that can be cultured represent a small proportion of those that are even in the feces or that are living in the gut. But this became the focus early on with these two classes of bacteria. And in the environment of these distinctions walked in Edward Batch. We often mispronounce his name. This is Edward Batch of the Batch Flower Remedies. It's, his name was not pronounced Bach, even though he was Welch and it should have been pronounced Bach, you know. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll call Batch as he preferred. Um, he was a bacteriologist and in 1919 he had the, um, uh, uh, one of the guys he housed with was an MD turned homeopath, um, Ed Wheeler. and, and uh, Ed apparently introduced Batch to the right people and Batch took a job as bacteriologist and pathologist at London Homeopathic Hospital and walked in there with no f prior understanding of homeopathy, perhaps a little bit of acquaintance from evening conversations with, with, uh, um, with Wheeler. And, uh, and he, started to, um, he, he started to continue some of the work he'd already been doing, which wasn't his own. I mean, th th this was very prevalent in the day. He was working with vaccine therapies, developing vaccines to bacteria. And um, um, the notion of developing vaccines to gut bacteria had already been uh, introduced. Other people were doing it. But Batch was playing with this. And he started playing with it in the company of homeopaths. That's about 1920. And he presented a, a presentation to the hospital, London Homeopathic Hospital, which is published in, in uh, uh, homeopathic Journal of the Day, um, British Journal of Homeopathy, the relation of vaccine therapy to homeopathy, in which he tries to make the point that vaccine therapy is actually very closely related to homeopathy. We're using a little bit of the hair of the dog that could habit you to get a reaction from the body. Very interesting paper. Now, one of the things that he noticed, and people had noticed before him, was that um, if you take people's poop, and you played it out on the culture media, which was in, in use in the day to, to look for coliforms, to look for these, these um, colon bacteria, this McConkie's agar, that um, in health, we found principally lactose fermenting bacilli growing out. Okay? In patients with chronic disease, we'd see colonies of non-lactose uh, fermenting bacilli growing. Okay? And, and these varied according to um, um, the disease of the patient. And there was a pattern that we would see in chronic disease of going back and forth between, between entirely lactose-fermenting bacilli 
and shedding of some non-lactose fermenting bacilli in the stools of people with chronic illness. And we're going to talk about those patterns and how those were used to design therapy in the class that comes up. So these were the, the two classes of bacteria okay, that they're looking at. Now, Batch was actually initially playing with autologous vaccination. In other words, he was having people poop, plating out their stool okay, on McConkie's agar, I, finding the, the colonies of non-lactose fermenting bacilli, okay, plating those out again, and from this, uh, creating a, a, a subdermal inject, uh, injection, you know, heat killing the bacteria and injecting these subdermally, okay, uh, in order to, quote, immunize against these, these bacteria in the stool. This was his philosophy, this was his idea. He also developed polyvalent vaccines, where he takes the stools, a bunch of stool samples from a bunch of people with, with some sort of chronic illness, individually cultures them, isolates the strains, does bacteriologic testing to identify the strains by the methods available at the day, which were kind of primitive compared to what we have today. So the ability to clearly identify what his nosodes were uh, and compare those to our knowledge of bacteria today is a bit limited. But then he would pool identical strains okay, um, and, and grow these out, and then create, early on, a potentized vaccine, okay, given by injection, and later a potentized nosod to be given by mouth um, as we give homeopathic remedies. And again, he's working closely with homeopathic remedies, particularly Wheeler and uh, Dishington uh, at this stage, um, I think led to some um, uh, movement in this direction of giving the, the remedy by mouth. His early vaccines were uh, were these, um, uh, Fecalis, Dysentery, Morgan, Gartner, Proteus, Coli Mutabile, and number seven, um, unidentified. Um, these identified tentatively to bacteria types known in the day. Tentatively, I would have to say. And Batch recognized that tentativeness. And he would prescribe on the results of a stool culture. Um, he would either give the autologous vaccine from the dominant non-lactose fermenting culture from the individual, you know, give them their own bacteria back to them as a vaccine, or identify the dominant non-lactose fermenting bacillus in the stool and use the corresponding polyvalent vaccine by injection or by potentized nosod. It's not real clear when Batch actually started using the potentized nosod by mouth. We know that he was using this by 1930, but it was apparently Thomas Dishington from Glasgow um, who became involved about 1927 you know, or so, who was uh, uh, pioneering the use of the oral remedy. So it's not clear whether Batch actually did a lot with the remedy in the no-sode form that we know today. He was principally using injectable vaccines. Elizabeth and John Peterson came along from Glasgow about 1927, and they set up a lab at the um, Homeopathic Hospital in Glasgow, Scotland. And they were involved, um, John through uh, 1950 and uh, Elizabeth through 1963 in furthering our development of these. And um, they furthered a development so that the contemporary collection of bowel nosodes that we have principally available to us and that are in principal use are Morgan Pure and Morgan Gartner, both Patterson, and X. Okay, These were all derived from Morgan Cole, Batch's original Morgan type. Okay. And this was felt to be a pure culture. And the Morgan Gartner was either another bacterium that had been contaminating this culture or perhaps a, a compound culture. And X, again, not much known about, not much used. Uh, Psychotic Co, which is massively misnamed, as we'll get to in the course. Dysentery Co, Proteus, and Gartner of Batch. Not to be confused with Morgan Gartner. Okay, these are quite different remedies. Now, one of the things that Peterson did, Peterson's did is very interesting. They followed a, a large number of patients who had been given conventional homeopathic remedies that were indicated for the case. Okay? And what they saw was when there was a curative response and they cultured the bacteria, that there was a, a dumping, basically, of non-lactose fermenting bacilli in the healing phase. So if, if, if an appropriate remedy had been given and there was a healing response, they would see this kind of exodus in the stool of non-lactose fermenting bacilli. And they didn't fully understand what the implications of that was, why those bacteria were in the stool. Were they 
Were they growing more profusely in the lumen? Were they being excreted because of this healing reaction? Who knows? We, we don't know. But this was observed. And they isolated these and characterized and identified them in a great number of cases. And from this developed a sense of concordance. In other words, when lycopodium was successfully given in a case, which bacteria were, were, uh, were pooped out? Okay and developed a set of concordances or relationships between conventional remedies and the bowel corresponding bowel bacteria. Now, in addition to prescribing on the basis of stool sampling, which was the original approach, um, because there's some burdensomeness with it that a lot of practitioners can't uh, manage, we can prescribe bowel nosins in other ways. We can prescribe on the results of um, of concordance with a conventional remedy. Okay. So for example, when an apparently well indicated remedy fails to act or acts only partially, if we give lycopodium to a case and it doesn't act and it looks for the world like a lycopodium case or it acts partially, we might consider a concordant bowel nosode. Okay. Or when the apparently best indicating remedy remains an unconvincing match. You take a case and it looks for the world like lycopodium, okay? But they like cold drinks. Things aren't dominantly one-sided, okay? Uh, like a podium, it's actually as much left-sided as right-sided, but it's one-sided, okay? But if we don't see that, and, and we, we, we just can't get our heads around giving this like a podium, we might look at the concordant bowel nosode to like a podium. Or if there's unusual sensitivity to an apparently well-indicated remedy, case looks like it needs lycopodium, but it aggravates no matter what remedy or potency we give it in and fails to respond, we might consider a concordant balnosod. And we might do any of these. We might use a balnosod in these cases, particularly if we suspect chronic bowel dysbiosis in the case, if there's some, you know, some issues with the stool that come out in case taking. Now, we'll see the suggestion that we might give a balnosod as we would tuberculinum or whatever, to clear the case, unquote. And I want to suggest that that's, that's a, um, th that phraseology really doesn't serve us well, okay? I would describe that as a shot in the dark come, okay? If, if you'll excuse my attempt at humor here. There's nowhere in Hahnemann's writings that tells us to clear a case with a remedy, okay? He does say that sometimes you have to give a best you can do a come, okay? Right? And in aphorisms 162 and 184, he describes those in the cases of first, insufficient remedies. We can't find a remedy that really covers this case. We have to give the best we can find. And in the second instance, in, in, the posi in a case with a paucity of symptoms, with insufficient symptomatology, we might have to open the case with the best shot we can. I think these are the situations in which, quote, to clear the case, really describe. Okay. So it means you still give the best remedy you can find, but it might be given with a lower sense of confidence than, than ordinary. And we may find ourselves giving a bowel nosod in this situation when, again, when, when we uh, uh, are not clearly seeing a well-known well remedy indicated and bowel disharmony, bowel dysbiosis appears to be um, uh, an aspect of the case. And very rarely we may give a bowel nosod when it shows up in the analysis, either obstinately, as this one does, or in a small remedies analysis of the case. Okay. This would be, um, uh, our confidence in giving it would, would be increased when we saw complementary um, uh, conventional remedies showing up well in the case, as we do here with Morgan Pure showing up, and graphitis, sepia, roost tox, remedies that are highly concordant with this balnosod showing up um, uh, alongside it. So um, Elizabeth Peterson, a survey of the nosodes, which is published in the British Homeopathic Journal, um, volume 49, um, is, is a wonderful resource for us. This is also uh, published separately as one of those little B. Jane pamphlets for two bucks. And it was republished in a more recent version of the British Homeopathic Journal, I think volume 77. I'll give you those references in a moment. Presents the results of 330 consecutive unselected cases. You know, this is wonderful. We don't see women publishing in homeopathy very often. But when they do, men, look at this. I mean, talk about overachieving, you know. 
right? What's the old thing about Ginger Rogers doing everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in high heels? Where do you see somebody publishing the results of 330 consecutive unselected cases? And she said, you know, most of these cases, Morgan Pure was the remedy given, and nearly half of them, okay? Morgan Gartner, Psychotic Co., and then to lesser extents, Dysentery Co., Proteus, Gartner Batch, number seven, and X, okay? By, by the way, there is a number 10 as well. There's a number seven, a number 10, and there's X. And in some of the literature, you'll find number 10 and X confused, okay? Number 10 is... Um, uh, is is an isolate on its own. X is actually um, uh, what happens when you further fractionate um, batches remedy Morgan into Morgan Pure, Morgan Gartner, and X. Um, some of the concordances um, she's described here, for example, Morgan Pure uh, is highly concordant with sulfur. Okay, um, and and uh, these are the numbers of cases in which she saw Morgan Pure and Sulfur coming in together in a case. Okay, either either the bacillus was excreted on a successful treatment with Sulfur, or Morgan Pure followed the Sulfur, or vice versa. Okay, Sulfur, Pulsatilla, Graphites, Sepia, Calcarea austriarum, okay, Cali Carbonicum, etc. Okay, Morgan Gartner, highly concordant with the Lycopodium. And most of the cases we'll find of, of Morgan Gartner are cases that look for the world, like Lycopodium. Okay? Also some concordance with sulfur, pulsatilla silica, sepia, etc. Okay. Psychotic Co, terribly misnamed, and we'll get to this in the in the upcoming course. Um, and, but I think you can see why here as we go through, although Thuya does factor in as one of the concordant remedies. Big concordant remedies, pulsatilla, lycopodium, sepia, tuberculinum, or basilinum, okay? And I think this remedy should be renamed tubercular co, but we'll talk about that in some depth here. Um, I, I just want to lead out before I finish up with, with these wonderful questions popping in with, you know, the, the um, future of balnosodes that uh, these bacteria that um, Edward Batch and, and the Petersons looked at um, uh, reasonably characterized for their day, not terribly well characterized for today. When we look at the actual population of uh, critters and plants living in the gut, okay, and 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 and, uh, and Monera, all of these. Um, there's this rich and diverse microbiota in not only in the gut but in the nose in the uh, gingiva of the teeth okay in the in the cheeks of the teeth uh, on the skin um, in various other portions of the body um, that cohabit with us and are, and are part of our and very intimate part of our biology they've barely touched uh, the diversity of these with the balnosids they've looked at and and I think there's a tremendous future in extending the work that they performed on looking further at the microba, at the microbes that uh, that reside with us, or co-reside with us, um, and this has a lot of implications in disease. Here, this is looking. These diagrams are. It would take a little bit to explain, but they're looking at the population diversity of gut microbes in health, in patients presenting with ulcerative colitis and with Crohn's disease, and we can see that the populations not only differ considerably. But uh, one of the big findings is that the populations of gut bugs in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is much less diverse than that seen in a healthy population. There's been a lot of speculation that particular microbes may be responsible for these diseases. But I think if we look beyond the individual microbe thing and look at the whole concept of gut population and community as a whole, it becomes fascinating in investigating these illnesses. Okay and on the possibility of designing treatments that act somehow in the gut bacteria. And, you know, there are individuals playing with things like fecal transplant to treat these diseases with some really wonderful documented success in this. Um, there still are, are individuals working with um, uh, bowel uh, bacterial vaccinations to address these diseases. But the, the portent, the, the possibility of using uh, bowel nosodes to impact on these diseases uh, through their effect on bowel bacteria is really uh, an interesting frontier for us. 
And, and particularly as we move into this recognition that we're not just dealing with a toxic gut with um, resident bacteria displacing them and preventing them from taking over, but we're actually dealing with a gut microbial community that is um, an intimate part of our being that protects us and interacts with our um, um, our physiology, our genetics in ways that are profound and and uh, and uh, very much intertwined with us as a part of our life. So I'm just going to close with uh, some resources, and I'll, I'll post these notes um, in the public section of the uh, course support site, uh, so that you have these notes along with the recording of this video. Um, you can go there and find it on the uh, um, uh, on the course site at whncourses.com. In the public section. Um, these are good core resources to begin with with a study. You'll find a lot more written uh, about the balnosids, but these are the places that I would start and that I would weigh the um, suggestions of other authors against. You're going to find a lot of confusing information as well as, as information that directs you in a good direction. So the, these are the solid resources here uh, for us. Let me jump in with a few more questions. And again, I, I'm sorry I don't have a uh, uh, an assistant tonight to read um, questions for me. So I'm going to pick these off for you quickly here. Um, the question, if a bowel nose would come in, in your repertorization, but there are no GI symptoms, how would that affect your decision to choose the bowel nose? You know, I find a lot of patients don't pay a lot of attention um, to what they put in the porcelain. And... Um, um, it, <laughs> I'm just remembering a case from back in Maine of a fellow who, who came in and, you know, very late stage um, bowel cancer. And I'd asked him if he'd ever noticed blood in his stools. And he said, oh, Jesus, doc. You know, because he, he, you know, he, he pooped in, a, in, a, uh, in an outhouse. And, and when it was too cold at night, he, he'd, he'd poop in a paint can and carry it out in the morning with a lid on it. So he had no idea whether there was blood in his stool or not. And, and then I think because of modern sensitivities, a lot of our patients don't pay a lot of attention looking in the porcelain. You ask them what their stools look like, or um, they're not going to be able to tell you. And, and as I mentioned, you know, a lot of people just, you know, if they've been like this for 15 years, they, they consider it normal. So I don't think I'd let the absence of GI symptoms steer me away from the analysis, from a bowel nosed, if it comes up strongly in a case. Uh, have I used an osteoporosis cases? I I've used them in cases of people who had osteoporosis, but that wasn't the presenting complaint. So um, I don't know about their effectiveness on the osteoporosis at all, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Someone mentions that there are followers who feel that um, bowel dysbiosis is the root of all illness, and we'll see that Edward Batch believed that to be true too. He, what, what Batch believed was that um, um, he and Dishington and... and, uh, um, and, and uh, um, um, I'm blanking. Um, he believed that uh, uh, bowel dysbiosis was responsible for what Hahnemann termed Sora. And we're going to talk more about that because I have some, as, as you'll know, my ideas about Sora, there's some very interesting implications there. Okay. Would I prescribe a bowel nose based only on mental emotional symptoms? I don't think I'd ever prescribe only on mental emotional symptoms. I, I, I think that I would feel. That was a very much a one-sided case, and, and I'd feel scared if all I had in the case were mental emotional expressions. I'd feel that I really hadn't obtained a, 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 a complete case. Um, how long after the curative response were they taking stool samples to see what was being dumped? Um, it was usually, there was usually a latency. There was usually a lag, and it could be up to two or three weeks before they would see the... Uh, um, the bacteria showing up in the in the stool, um, uh, and and Betch talked about that a lot, and talked about the the implications of that latency and what that might might mean. Okay. Okay. Um, diet. We're going to talk about diet. Okay. Somebody asked about Russell Malcolm. Um, Russell Malcolm's a contemporary um, who's written a lot on on the balnosodes and did a really wonderful workshop back in two thousand two, and I'll be referencing his, his material and. Um, um, uh, we'll take a look at, at, at some of that. Uh, Malcolm's done a nice job in resurrecting some of the historical literature, and uh, we'll go from there for those. So, 
Okay. Um, is 18C the highest you give? No, and we'll see in the in the course I talk about this. I've I've gone as high as 30C. I, I've not gone above, but historically folks have used 1M. I have gone above um, um, that even. Um, but I, I typically will give 6C, 18C, 30C, and I'll give repetitive doses in water as well, um, which is something more recent in, in, in my practice. Um, and I found that to be a very helpful strategy sometimes. What's the look and size of a good bowel movement? Oh, talk to any naturopath. Um, they love to talk about bowel movements with you. I think people will vary as to whether they declare um, the type 4 or type 3 as, as being the most optimal for health, um, somewhere in between these. Some people will say this is incipient constipation. Some people will say this is a little too loose. But somewhere in here is usually considered, quote, um, healthy bowel movement. But of course, there's more than just conformation and shape that we one would have to go on. You know, mucus coat, um, um, color, odor, etc. Et um, but grab grab four naturopaths and get them talking about bowel movements because they they'll just have the time of their lives doing that. You know. Okay. Okay. So um, let's see. Well, I think that pretty much covers the questions. So guys, um, as usual, I've run over my allotted time, but uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for uh, stimulating this discussion. Um, Y'all take care and, uh, and good evening.